Hello, everyone. Before we begin, I want to ask you something. Are you ready to hear a story that could change the way you look at life? If the answer is yes, then let's get started right now. It was a brisk morning in December, the kind of day when the chill in the air nipped at your skin and reminded you how much time had passed. I stood at the kitchen counter, stirring my coffee, watching the steam curl into the cold, silent room. The faint hum of the heater and the rhythmic ticking of the wall clock were the only sounds accompanying my thoughts. For years, this house had been a sanctuary, a place where my wife, Laura, and I raised our two children, Anna, 10, and Sam, 7. But lately, it had become a quiet battlefield, a space where words carried hidden meanings and silences spoke louder than any argument. Laura was running late, again. Her new job had brought with it long hours and an endless series of commitments. While I tried to be supportive, her absence was beginning to feel like a shadow creeping into the corners of our marriage. I watched her rush through the kitchen, grabbing her purse and car keys, her lips moving with a distracted, I love you, before she disappeared out the door. The warmth in those words had faded, like a well-rehearsed line from an actor who no longer felt the part. I took another sip of my coffee, staring at the chair she used to sit in for breakfast with us. There was an ache I couldn't quite place, a gnawing sense that something was slipping away. I wanted to dismiss it as paranoia, the overthinking of a man juggling the chaos of family life and the pressures of work. But the look in her eyes lately, distant, almost evasive, told me otherwise. That Christmas, Laura attended her office party, leaving me home with the kids. It's just a small thing, she'd said. No spouses allowed. At the time, I'd believed her, brushing off the sting of being excluded. It wasn't unusual for work events to have these rules, after all. But that night, when she came home, her face was flushed, her makeup smudged, and the faint smell of someone else's cologne lingered on her clothes. I'd asked how the party was, and her answer had been as vague as the excuses she'd been offering for months. Fine, she said, slipping past me toward the shower. <sighs> for weeks. That night stayed with me like an itch I couldn't scratch. It wasn't until I ran into Mike Cooper, an old college friend, that the puzzle pieces began to fall into place. Mike worked in Laura's office building, and during our conversation, he casually mentioned how much fun the Christmas party had been with all the spouses in attendance. Oh, I, I remember the way my stomach tightened, a, a knot of doubt and dread forming instantly. Al, the spouses? I asked, my voice laced with forced nonchalance. Mike nodded. Yeah, it was a real family affair this year. The world seemed to tilt for a moment. I stood there, clutching my coffee cup tighter, trying to reconcile his words with Laura's story. When I got home that evening, I confronted her, the question burning on my tongue like acid. Who pretended to be your spouse at that party, I demanded, and where the hell did you spend the night? Laura's face paled, her eyes darting away from mine. David, I've told you a dozen times, she said. Her voice strained. I thought spouses weren't invited. It must have been a misunderstanding. But her explanation felt as hollow as the smile she'd been wearing lately. I wanted to believe her. I truly did. Yet, the image of her flushed face that night and the lingering scent of cologne I didn't own haunted me. It wasn't just the party. It was the late nights. The guarded texts the way she avoided my gaze when I asked about her day. Doubt had taken root in my mind, and no amount of reassurance could dislodge it. In the weeks that followed, I began to notice the cracks in our relationship widening. Laura was always on her phone, her screen tilted away from me. She started taking calls in the bedroom with the door closed, her voice hushed. I'd catch glimpses of her reflection in the window as she smiled at a text, a smile that hadn't been meant for me in months. One evening, as we sat in silence on opposite ends of the couch, I found myself questioning everything. Had I failed her as a husband? Was this distance between us my fault? 
The questions swirled in my head, each one heavier than the last. I wanted to reach out, to bridge the growing chasm between us, but every time I tried, it felt like she slipped further away. The turning point came at her company's farewell party. She'd reluctantly invited me along, perhaps out of obligation or guilt. As we walked into the room, I felt the weight of her discomfort like a tangible thing. She avoided introducing me to her co-workers. Her laughter strained when I tried to engage in conversation, but the moment that shattered any illusion of trust was when her boss, a jovial man with a booming voice, clapped me on the shoulder and said, You must have missed out on a great Christmas party. All the spouses had such a wonderful time. I turned to Laura, my heart pounding in my chest. Her face was a mask of forced composure, her lips pressed into a thin line. How could you miss that? I asked her later, my voice a mix of anger and disbelief. You came home late that night, Laura, disheveled and drunk. I'm sure you preferred someone else's company instead of mine. Her tears came then, a flood of emotion that only deepened my suspicions. It wasn't like that, she sobbed. It was just a small group, a few drinks, some dancing. Nothing happened. But her words felt like ashes in my mouth, insubstantial and impossible to swallow. My mind replayed every detail of the past few months, the late nights, the secretive behavior, the lies. Trust, once broken, has a way of magnifying every flaw, every imperfection, until all that's left is doubt. As I lay awake that night, staring at the ceiling, a cold realization settled over me. My marriage, once a source of comfort and joy, had become a battleground of secrets and suspicion. The woman I had loved for over a decade felt like a stranger, and the life we had built together was beginning to feel like a carefully constructed lie. I didn't know how to confront her again. I didn't know if I wanted to. But one thing was certain. The truth, however painful, was no longer something I could avoid. The walls of our house, once filled with laughter and love, now seemed to echo with the sound of silence and broken trust. And I was left wondering, how much more of this could I endure before everything came crashing down? The farewell party was supposed to be a chance to mend things, or so I thought. The invitation had come begrudgingly, Laura handing it to me with a half-hearted smile, as though it were an obligation she couldn't avoid. I convinced myself it was a step forward, an opportunity to reconnect, or at least to show her colleagues that I was still a part of her life. But as we walked into the venue that night, her unease wrapped around me like a second skin. The room buzzed with laughter and clinking glasses, the air thick with the scent of perfume and ambition. Laura greeted her co-workers with familiarity, her laughter light but strained, like a melody just slightly out of tune. She introduced me to no one, instead weaving through the crowd as though trying to escape my presence. I followed at a polite distance, my heart heavy with the realization that I was more of a shadow than a partner. And then it happened. Her boss, a man with an affable smile and a handshake that lingered too long, clasped my shoulder as though we were old friends. You must have missed out on a great Christmas party, he said, his voice booming over the music. All the spouses had such a wonderful time. Laura was the life of the party, wasn't she? His words hit me like a punch to the gut. My stomach churned as I turned to Laura, who stood frozen her face betraying a flicker of panic before she forced a tight smile. It was a misunderstanding, she said quickly, her voice trembling. David wasn't feeling well, so he stayed home. Don't forget to like if you find this story meaningful to you, and subscribe so you don't miss the next stories. I stared at her, the room spinning as disbelief gave way to something darker. I'm a misunderstanding. I echoed, my voice low but sharp. Funny. I don't recall being invited. <laughs> At all. Her boss chuckled, oblivious to the tension crackling between us. Ah, you should have come. 
It was a lovely evening. Laura spent most of the night chatting with Chris. You know, from marketing. Those two really hit it off. The name struck like lightning, igniting a firestorm of emotions I could barely contain. Chris. I'd heard her mention him in passing, a colleague, someone she worked closely with. But the casual ease with which her boss paired their names, like a couple in a dance, sent a wave of nausea crashing over me. I turned back to Laura, her face now pale, her eyes darting around the room as if searching for an escape. David, not here, she whispered, her voice pleading, please. But the dam had already broken. Not here? I repeated, the words bitter on my tongue. Then where, Laura? Where is it appropriate to discuss why my wife spent Christmas with someone else instead of her family? A few heads turned, curious glances cutting through the crowd. Laura grabbed my arm, her nails digging into my skin. Let's talk outside, she hissed, her smile plastered in place as though that could mask the crumbling facade of our marriage. Outside, the cold night air hit me like a slap, but it did little to quell the storm brewing inside. I rounded on her, my voice a mix of hurt and fury. You lied to me. You told me spouses weren't invited, and now I find out you were the life of the party? With Chris of all people? Tears welled in her eyes, but they only fueled my anger. I didn't lie, she insisted, her voice breaking. It was a misunderstanding. I didn't think it was a big deal. In a big deal? I snapped, my voice rising. You danced with him, didn't you? Spent the night drinking and laughing while I was at home with our kids, wondering why my wife didn't want me there? Do you have any idea how humiliating this is? Laura broke down then, her sobs filling the empty street. It wasn't like that, she cried. It was just dancing, David, that's all. But her words, her tears felt like smoke in a room already engulfed in flames. I wanted to believe her, to cling to the hope that this was all a misunderstanding, but the cracks were too wide, the inconsistencies too glaring. Doubt, once seated, had grown into a monster that now consumed everything in its path. The ride home was silent, the tension between us a living, breathing thing. I stared out the window, my reflection a stranger's face. The man I saw was no longer just hurt. He was angry, suspicious, and desperate for answers. And as I replayed the night in my mind, the pieces began to form a picture I couldn't ignore. Who was Chris? And what had really happened that night at the Christmas party? I didn't know the answers yet, but one thing was certain. I was going to find out. The days that followed felt like walking through a storm, the world around me blurred by a constant haze of suspicion. The house, once a refuge of laughter and warmth, had become a cold war zone. Laura moved through the rooms like a ghost, her gaze avoiding mine, her words clipped and careful. Even the children seemed to sense the unease, their usual chatter subdued as if they could feel the unspoken tension hanging heavy in the air. I couldn't shake the image of her boss's words or the way her face had crumbled when confronted. My mind became a prison, replaying every moment from that night, scrutinizing every detail. Laura and Chris. Dancing, laughing, perhaps something more. The questions clawed at me, relentless and unyielding. Who was Chris to her? What did he give her that I couldn't? In the quiet moments, when the kids were asleep and Laura locked herself in the bathroom under the pretense of a long bath, I'd sit in the dark living room, scrolling through my phone, searching for answers. I started to notice patterns in her behavior I'd previously dismissed, the quick swipes of her phone screen when I entered the room, the late nights, working at the office, the new perfume she'd started wearing, a scent I'd never smelled before, it wasn't long before I took the first step into the shadows of doubt. I accessed her email, scrolling through innocuous work messages, until something caught my eye, a notification for a new email account. The name was benign, Laura Newton. 
but it wasn't an account I recognized. My chest tightened as I realized this was no accident. This was deliberate. Hidden. The first email I opened was like a punch to the gut. Chris, I missed your sweet kisses and warm embrace. Last night felt too short. I stared at the words, their weight pressing down on my chest like a stone. My hands trembled as I clicked through the thread, each message a dagger to my heart. Laura, I'll take the day off, but we need to keep a low profile. David starting to ask questions. The bile rose in my throat as I read her words. The warmth, the intimacy in her tone was a stranger's voice, one I hadn't heard in years. She was his Laura now, not mine. My Laura, the mother of my children, the woman I'd built a life with, had given herself to someone else. The rage came first, hot and blinding, burning through the numbness that had gripped me for weeks. How dare she? How dare she look me in the eyes, cry crocodile tears, and lie with such ease? The betrayal was a knife in my back, twisting with every new revelation. But beneath the anger, deeper and more insidious, was the pain. The hollow ache of knowing that the woman I loved, the woman I'd trusted, had chosen someone else. I became a man possessed, driven by the need to know the truth, no matter how much it hurt. I tracked her movements, noting the subtle lies she told to cover her tracks. Just running errands, she'd say, her voice breezy. But I followed her one afternoon, my hands gripping the steering wheel as I trailed her car at a safe distance. She parked in front of a modest apartment complex, the kind of place we used to joke about when we were younger, dreaming of our perfect suburban life. I watched as she walked up to the door, her steps hesitant but deliberate. She knocked, and the door opened to reveal Chris, a man I'd only seen in passing at her office functions. He pulled her inside with the kind of familiarity that set my blood boiling. I waited, my heart pounding, my mind racing through the possibilities. The minutes dragged like hours until she reemerged, her hair slightly disheveled, her cheeks flushed. I gripped the steering wheel tighter, the leather groaning under my hands. That night, I couldn't look at her without seeing him. The lies she told, the nights she spent in his arms, it was all there playing on a loop in my mind. I started making plans, not out of desperation, but out of a need for control. I met with a lawyer, quietly moving funds from our shared accounts into one she couldn't access. If she wanted to build a life with Chris, she'd have to do it without my help. The hardest part was pretending. So many opportunities were on time for the erupted. Just by asking her how she did, she insisted on doing my main procedures. The hardest part was pretending. Beneath the surface, a storm was brewing, growing stronger with every passing day and I knew it was only a matter of time before it erupted. Just by asking her how she did, she insisted on me fixing her dinner. The night it all came crashing down, the air felt charged, like the calm before a thunderstorm. I had rehearsed this moment in my head countless times, each scenario more volatile than the last. But no amount of preparation could brace me for the raw, unfiltered chaos that unfolded. It started with a text. Her phone buzzed on the kitchen counter as she prepared dinner. She didn't notice it, her back to me, humming a tune I hadn't heard in years. I picked up the phone, the light illuminating a message from Chris. Can't stop thinking about earlier. Let's make it happen again soon. The words seemed to scream at me louder than the hum of the refrigerator or the clatter of pots and pans. My pulse quickened, the heat of rage spreading through my chest like wildfire. I set the phone down carefully as if it might explode and took a step back. My hands trembled, clenched into fists by my sides. Who is he, Laura? The question came out low, steady, but carrying the weight of a storm. She froze, 
the knife in her hand hovering over the cutting board. Slowly, she turned to face me, her eyes wide, a deer caught in the headlights. What are you talking about? She asked, her voice calm, too calm, as though she'd rehearsed this lie a hundred times. The room seemed to close in around us, the wall shrinking, the air suffocating. Don't, I said, my voice rising. Don't insult me with more lies. I know everything. Chris, the emails, the nights you said you were working late. I followed you, Laura. I've seen you with him. Her mouth opened, but no words came. For a moment, I saw fear flicker across her face, quickly replaced by something sharper. Defiance. You went through my emails? She snapped, her voice trembling. You spied on me? That's insane, David. The hypocrisy of her accusation was a dagger to my chest. Insane? I shouted, my voice cracking under the weight of my anger. What's insane is how you looked me in the eyes every single day and lied to my face. How you came home to our children smelling like another man's cologne. Her face crumpled then, tears spilling over as she shook her head. It wasn't supposed to happen like this, she whispered, her voice barely audible. I didn't mean for it to get this far. Her confession hit me like a sledgehammer. I stumbled back, gripping the edge of the counter for support. The anger that had been fueling me began to crack giving way to something darker, something colder. How far, Laura? I asked, my voice deadly quiet. How far did it go? The silence that followed was deafening. She couldn't look at me, her tears falling onto the cutting board like tiny shards of glass. That silence was my answer. The next hours unfolded in a blur of shouting, accusations, and raw, unfiltered emotion. At some point, I found myself in my car, driving to Chris's apartment, my hands gripping the steering wheel so tightly they turned white. I didn't know what I planned to do, but the rage inside me demanded release. When I arrived, I didn't knock. I kicked the door open with a force I didn't know I possessed, the wood splintering under the impact. Chris stood in the living room, Startled, his face quickly morphing from confusion to fear. You think you can take what's mine? I roared, my voice echoing through the small apartment. You think you can ruin my family and walk away unscathed? He stammered something, but I didn't hear it. The rage had taken over, a tidal wave that couldn't be stopped. I grabbed the nearest thing, a sledgehammer from the corner of the room and brought it down on the coffee table, the glass shattering in a deafening crash. Chris backed away, his hands raised in surrender, but it only enraged me further. Laura appeared behind me, her voice pleading, David, stop. Please, stop, this isn't you. But it was too late. The man I had been, the calm, rational husband, the devoted father, was gone, replaced by someone I barely recognized. I turned to her, the sledgehammer still in my hands, my breath ragged. He's yours now, I said, the words laced with venom. Be with him, Laura. Build your life with him. But don't you dare come crawling back to me. Her sobs filled the air, but I didn't care. I dropped the sledgehammer with a finality that seemed to shake the ground and walked out leaving behind a trail of destruction that mirrored the wreckage inside me. As I drove away, the adrenaline began to fade, replaced by a hollow, aching regret. Not for what I had done, but for what had been lost. My marriage, my trust, my family. They were all in ruins, and I couldn't see a way to rebuild them. The man I had been when I first said, I do, no longer existed and I wasn't sure if I ever wanted to find him again. The drive home was a blur. The shattered remnants of Chris's apartment lingered in my mind like a bitter aftertaste, but the anger that had fueled me had begun to ebb, leaving behind exhaustion. The sledgehammer I'd wielded wasn't just a tool of destruction. It was a metaphor for everything I'd been feeling. The weight of betrayal, the raw, unchecked fury, 
and the unbearable pain of knowing my marriage had crumbled beyond repair. When I pulled into the driveway, the house loomed in the darkness, its silhouette no longer a comforting refuge, but a hollow shell of what it had once been. The lights were off. Laura hadn't returned. I stepped inside and was greeted by silence, the kind that felt heavy and oppressive. Even the familiar warmth of my children's laughter, which had once filled this space, felt like a distant memory. Upstairs, I found Anna and Sam asleep in their beds, their faces peaceful, unbothered by the chaos tearing their parents apart. I lingered in their doorways longer than I should have, overwhelmed by guilt. How could I protect them from this storm? How could I be both father and anchor when I was barely holding myself together? The next morning, Laura was gone. She had left a note on the counter. Simple, apologetic, but hollow in its sincerity. I'm staying with my sister for now. I need space. I'm sorry, David. I stood there staring at the note, its edges curling slightly under the heat of the morning sunlight streaming through the window. It wasn't anger that I felt this time, but something quieter, something more profound. Disappointment. In her. In myself. In what we had allowed to happen to the life we'd built together. I crumpled the note in my hand, the paper's crackle loud in the trash can, and tossed it into the trash. Um, it felt symbolic, letting go of her, of us. For the next few weeks, life fell into a strange rhythm. I focused on the kids, throwing myself into routines and work to keep my mind from wandering too far into the past. At first, the emptiness was suffocating a constant reminder of what had been lost. But as the days turned into weeks, I began to notice something else. A faint, flickering sense of clarity. The anger that had consumed me started to fade, replaced by a resolve to rebuild, not for Laura, not for the life we'd lost, but for myself and my children. It was during this time, that Emma stepped into my life in a way I hadn't expected. She had been my secretary for years, quietly efficient, always kind but never intrusive. When she heard about my situation, she offered to help with the little things. Picking up the kids when I was stuck at work, dropping off groceries when my schedule overwhelmed me. At first, I resisted, uncomfortable with the idea of leaning on someone. But Emma had a way of softening the sharp edges of my pride, her presence like a balm on an open wound. One afternoon, as she sat at the kitchen table helping Anna with her math homework, I found myself watching her from the doorway. Her laughter was light and genuine, the kind that seemed to lift the weight of the air around her. It was a sound I hadn't realized I'd missed in my home. For the first time in months, I felt something stir within me, hope. Emma's kindness wasn't flashy or forced. It was steady, like the tide returning to the shore after a storm. We began to talk more, not just about work or the kids, but about life, about the pain we both carried. She had left her own marriage years ago, escaping an abusive husband, and the strength she'd found in her journey inspired me. In her, I saw not just a friend, but a partner, someone who understood brokenness yet believed in healing. One evening, as we sat on the back porch watching the kids play in the yard, she turned to me, her gaze steady. You don't have to rush, David, she said. Her voice soft but firm. Healing takes time, but when you're ready, know that you deserve happiness too. Her words settled over me like a warm blanket, filling the cracks that had formed in my heart. I didn't respond immediately instead letting the moment linger, savoring the possibility of something better, something whole. As the weeks turned into months, Emma and I grew closer. It wasn't perfect. There were still days when the past loomed large, when memories of Laura's betrayal resurfaced like uninvited ghosts. But each day felt like a step forward, a chance to rebuild, not just for myself, but for Anna and Sam 
who needed to see their father rise from the ashes of his pain. By the time the divorce papers were finalized, I felt an odd sense of peace. Laura's absence no longer haunted me, and the life I was beginning to build with Emma and the kids felt like the promise of spring after a long, harsh winter. The scars would remain, yes, but they no longer defined me. I had found something more valuable in their place. Resilience, hope, and the courage to believe in love again. And as Emma squeezed my hand that evening, her smile soft but certain, I allowed myself to believe that the best chapters of my life were still waiting to be written. The sky was painted in hues of gold and crimson, the kind of sunset that seemed to promise a fresh start. I sat on the porch steps, watching Anna and Sam chase fireflies across the yard, their laughter rippling through the air like a soothing melody. For the first time in what felt like an eternity, the knot in my chest began to loosen. Life, I realized, had a way of breaking you down, grinding you into fragments of who you once were. But in those fragments, I had found something unexpected, a chance to rebuild. The pieces would never fit the same way again, but maybe that was the point. Healing wasn't about restoring what was. It was about creating something new, something stronger. Emma stepped onto the porch, two mugs of tea in her hands. She handed me one, her fingers brushing mine in a gesture so simple yet grounding. It's beautiful tonight, she said, her voice soft, as if afraid to disturb the moment. I nodded, my gaze fixed on the horizon. It is, I replied, the words carrying more meaning than she could know. It wasn't just the evening. It was the peace settling into my soul, the realization that the storm had passed, leaving room for hope to take root. The wounds Laura left would never fully disappear, but they no longer bled. Instead, they had become scars, a reminder of the battles I'd fought, the pain I'd endured, and the strength I'd discovered. As Emma sat beside me, her presence steady and sure, I felt something I thought I'd lost forever. Gratitude. For the love I'd found in her, for the family we were becoming, and for the man I was learning to be, whole, flawed, and ready to embrace the future.